Father absence, I think, is the biggest problem we have in the nation. I think if every father went and claimed their kids and fathered their kids and disciplined their kids, we wouldn't have all the problems that we have today. <laughs> be patient, don't be. <laughs> Please understand this, that every single social ill that we're dealing with is directly or indirectly related to fatherlessness. Isaiah, Isaiah, here we are. Ah! are heroic and, and extraordinary people. I just wish there didn't have to be so many single moms. I wish moms had the help of a father who was a husband and a, a loving helpmate in, in raising children that, that are, are loved and appreciated and valued. I really didn't have a relationship with my dad. Um, I think he came to visit once. I think that was eight or nine. I was eight or nine years old when I last technically saw him, but before that, really didn't uh, know him very much. So I come from a broken home, and my dad, when I was six, he ended up leaving the house. He rarely showed love. After the divorce, I have a hard time remembering a moment where he said something that affirmed that he loved me. He was just, um, he wasn't very invested, maybe is a better way to put it. My relationship with my dad was incredible. Uh, I loved my dad. Uh, my dad was tough. He, he was a Christian man. He taught Bible uh, in his church for over 40 years. Uh, he was just a man's man, but he's also extremely affectionate to us and extremely loving. I respected him. I feared him, literally. But when he died and I got to do the memorial service for his um, funeral, uh, it was a very emotional time for me because, again, uh, no one revered their dad more than me. We're coming home, Tommy and Josiah. Uh, according to the Census Bureau, 18.4 million children, that's one in four, live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. That's pretty staggering when you listen to this. That's enough children to fill New York City twice or Los Angeles four times over. So this is, again, a big, big problem. And so that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the idea of fatherhood being downgraded, uh, the responsibilities of fatherhood being completely ignored, and then the allowance or the commonality of fatherhood being socially acceptable has become really, I think, one of the leading causes for the corrosion and for the, the effect on society that we see right now. And all of that goes back to men are not committed to be fathers. I got really good grades. I think I ended up, or not really good grades, but 3.83 was my average. I got A's and B's in, in high school. And I can't recall a time where my dad really showed like, hey, you're doing really, really good. I do remember when I got my ACT score, he noted out, hey, you got a 27, great job. Like, but that was, like, that was the rare occasion where he would say good job and, and show that he was proud of me or, or cared. So after the divorce, once my stepmom came into the game, he basically let her be the head of the house and that drove me and my brother 
pretty crazy, drove us mad. Uh, we were angry about that. We hated our stepmom. And I think she, to some degree, picked up on that. And my dad just, if or when she couldn't get through to us, she would bring in my dad and say, hey, your sons are, are not listening to me. They need to be grounded or, or punished uh, in some way. I didn't grow up with a dad, and that was such a huge part of uh, the fact that I, um, I didn't know any of these things that regarding uh, being a father and uh, what a, a normal home would look like, any of that stuff. And so to get to a place where the Lord providentially placed a man into my life, that became a father figure, and to this day really is. I like him to uh, a father. I call him dad, uh, nevertheless. His name is Carlo Wolf. Carlo showed me a lot about what it was like to be in a home that had a mom and a dad and what it was like to have structure. I think dads bring a bit of that structure. So there was some practical ways in which he modeled what things he did as a dad in his own family that I was able to see firsthand. Son, this is what you looked like before. And your mother has done such a great job in carrying her. Look how beautiful she is. That is your mother. She's young. She's lovely. We're actually leaving the door. We're about to go. 606. About to go you. So, and then let me I'm gonna give this to mom and she's gonna show you me just for a second. There's daddy. Here I am. My, um, the proud papa. Two days away from being 40. So that's <laughs> there she is. And it's Miss afterwards. America. Miss America. We have you, Josiah. That's you. We're going home from the hospital. Um, you know, this is you. We're at the 20th. Mama's going back to Tulsa. Two, one. Happy 2002. Hey, let's get some light on the subject, Josiah, Josiah, happy 2002. My dad was my hero, and I don't know a lot of guys that can say that. He was not a perfect man, but it was dad that kept us together. It was dad that organized the events. It was dad that made us come together and go around the room and pray, and when he left, I'm the oldest son. Um, I didn't feel like I had the same clout that he did. Mom is just a delicate person and she didn't have the same kind of uh, charisma that dad did. So things did, even in our Christian home, start to deteriorate a little bit after he died. We were all out of the house by that time and had our own families, but it was just a, a hallmark to show that he was really a man to be respected and a man to be honored and a man to be loved. In a rare way, at least in our culture, before knowing Christ, I always wanted to be a dad. And, I, and a large part of it, that was, I think, rooted in when I hung out with my friend's parents. But if, I wouldn't be shocked if I were to find out in eternity, if this conversation were to even happen, uh, that the influences from that Mormon family uh, impacted the way I, I, I uh, am a dad now. You know, it really starts with young men embracing the hardships of life and not evading them. I think men have to embrace loving the idea of being a father and embrace the idea of being a husband. And that's part of what it is to be a man, not only to see the mandate that we see in scripture about uh, what it's like to be made in the image of God, what does that mean? It, it, it entails us um, thinking about the generation to come. It doesn't stop with us, it continues. We're just part of it and how we're gonna pass on the knowledge of God to the next generation.
I've never felt the feeling that I felt when until my children were born. I, it was like in my manna, in my bones of bones, I felt like an ache that was the most surprising, precious thing that I've ever felt. And I told my wife about it. I'm going like, I've never physically felt this way, the love I have for my sons. Yeah, if I had to, if I had things to do over again, which you can't, I guess there's really no profit in thinking about what you regret. It's just when it comes down to it, I just wish that I'd been just a little bit more, a little bit more grace and not so much law. I think that would have helped. One of those most beautiful things I'm so thankful for that object lesson as I'm looking at my beautiful little daughter, two months old, Eva, and thinking about how Christ was a baby and how the Heavenly Father saw His only begotten, beloved Son. And then to think that one day I would crush my own beloved daughter for criminals. I'm going to slaughter my only daughter for the sake of criminals. And until you have your own kid, you really don't appreciate that.